Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired's 2021 Gallery Night. We are so absolutely delighted that you have chosen to, uh, to join us. I'm Denise Jess, the Executive Director of the Council. For those of you who may not be familiar with who we are, let me just take a pause before we move into the full evening to share a little bit about our mission and our work. The Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired is 69 years old this year, and we'll be happy to turn 70 uh, next. And our mission is to promote the dignity and empowerment of people living with vision loss throughout our beautiful state of Wisconsin. The values that guide us every day in our work are integrity, uncompromising respect, and inclusivity. So how do we go about fulfilling our mission? We do that in three primary ways. The first is vision services. For those of us who live with vision loss, we can do many, many things that fulfill our lives and bring us much joy. And we need to just simply find ways to do them that might be different um, from how those of you with sight do them. So for anyone who is losing vision later in life, there's a whole set of skills that we have the ability to work with you to learn and, and be able to do those activities that really bring you joy, including reading and cooking, and as we'll discover tonight, incredible artwork. Another part of our mission is fulfilled through education. We know that as folks encounter people with vision loss, either through programs like this or out in our community work, that we can help open hearts and minds to realize the incredible potential of people with vision loss. And we can also support people on their own vision loss journey as they work through the many, many feelings that go with these changes in life. And the last way that we fulfill our mission is through systems and policy advocacy work. No matter how skilled any of us are in our vision uh, rehabilitation abilities, no matter how many awesome tools we have for being able to do the things that we want to do, the many systemic barriers, including lack of transportation, voting access, um, employment barriers, education barriers, and healthcare barriers can still get in our way of achieving our full life goals. So that systems advocacy is the cornerstone of the council's work. So as we move into tonight, our really our primary focus is on our education work because gallery night is just an exemplary sample of what that education means. We're going to meet eight incredible artists, uh, and I just smile thinking about them, having uh, heard about them through their work, having watched the videos that they have um, submitted for our talk tonight, and knowing some of them personally. I think that as you meet them and hear from them, see their incredible work, your heart will be opened as well. So eight artists, two by two by two by two. We'll introduce you to two of them at a time so that you have time to really take in their work and hear about it, get a feel for it. Then we'll move into some other pieces of the program and I'll tell you about those as we get to them. And by the end of the night, you will know these eight folks who range from adolescents to 80 year olds, which is amazing to me to hear their stories. We'll also have an opportunity to know that they're from all over the state. So they're not just here in the southern part of the state. They're not just um, in the northern part of the state. They are absolutely from everywhere throughout our beautiful state. Their work includes painting, photography, woodwork, sculpture, and animation drawings, to name just a little bit of it. We're so proud at the council to participate in gallery night. This is our 10th year of doing this. 
Every year, the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art sponsors a citywide gallery night. Last year, they took a break from that because of COVID, but we just moved online. And it was so exciting to be able to uh, have people from all over the state and actually all over the country participate in gallery night. So if you're online now watching us on YouTube, feel free to put a comment in about where you're watching from. And also comment if you know one of the artists, because that would be so fun for us to find out as well. Tonight, Gallery Night is happening live throughout the city of Madison. And after our first snowfall here tonight, we're really happy that you're home safe in your living rooms watching us. So let's sit back um, as you're watching the uh, videos for each artist, you'll find that they're accessible as well. So each person is introduced and then there'll be an audio description of the artwork so that those who have um, vision loss are able to fully participate as well. One side note, we had hoped to have this evening's presentation also closed captioned for our folks who benefit from that accessibility as well, and we're unable to secure a captionist. So when we put this up live, uh, recorded on YouTube, we'll add the captioning at that point. So please enjoy yourself tonight, and we'll meet two of our artists right off the bat. And as you hear their stories, Listen for what inspires them, what motivates them, and how they use their creativity and their ingenuity to create beautiful artwork with vision impairment. Artist Ellen Connor, title Small Town Summer. Audio description, photograph of the entrance to an ice cream parlor across the street from the water with a red and white striped awning, American flag, and cars parked across the road. I guess when my kids were little, I, I started do, taking photographs mostly to, you know, to document their growing up. And then as they got older and went off to college, um, I had gotten interested in nature and had started doing some hiking and taking some nature classes, originally through Lawrence University, through a program called Bjorklund. And um, in the nature classes, there were a lot of fantastic things that we would find and I knew I wasn't going to remember all of them for later to write them down. So I, I started um, taking pictures at that, you know, of those as well. Some with my cell phone, um, some with a little Canon um, digital camera. And that, that's kind of how, how I got started. And then it be just became more of an artistic endeavor. Like I go out looking for things specifically, you know, and looking for certain times a day to, to take the photographs to get certain effects. It, it depends on what's going on from a nature standpoint. Like last winter, there was one day when the, when the sun was just really, really brilliant and we had brand new snow, like less than 12 hours old snow. And so I knew that, that things were gonna be really covered in snow and that, that probably some of the, um, the grasses and you know leaves and things that were still um, on, on bushes and on trees would, would look pretty unique. So I went, you know, I went out at, the, at that particular time um, or um, like when I took the, this photo that's in the exhibit, um, I was out, we had, we had arranged a quick trip to Ephraim in Door County for um, some really good friends because one of them was, had been very ill and this was where he had spent all of his childhood summers. And so I took the photos when I noticed that we were, we were sitting at a restaurant and I noticed that the light had kind of gone to golden hour so that things were looking almost, what would be the best way to describe it? it it's like there was an other world quality. A lot of times when, when you get to golden hour in the evening, about an hour or two before sunset, the light just changes the way that things look and it makes things, ordinary things look fairly special. And I happened to look up and see the sunset and see the flag off to the left of the sunset and. You know, it was just kind of the quintessential Wisconsin summer evening, you know, that when you, when you think of like the perfect summer evening. Um, and so that was, that was why I took that particular picture. So sometimes it's the light, sometimes it's knowing what's happening in nature at that particular time. So um, it's different things at different times of the year. 
Now that was originally, that was one of the reasons I was taking some of the photographs is that, you know, maybe we'll go out and there's a, a, a wildflower and I, um, I really can't see any of the details of it. I can see the color of it. You know, maybe I can see it's white or it's pink. And um, so then I will use either my cell phone or a, a digital camera and um, take a photograph of it. And then when I bring it home, um, I use a Mac computer and I use the magnification programs that are available through Mac to bring it up. And then I can actually see that the white flower has um, almost like pinstripes in it. And it's, it's a, one that's called grasses of Parnassus. Um, but I can't, you know, I, I can't see that on my own when I'm just standing on a boardwalk or standing on a trail looking down. It just looks white. Um, so sometimes I'm using it like that. I, I like to do birding before I um, started having some vision loss and um, my significant other uh, would t take the photos of the birds. Sometimes I could see them because they were really brilliant colors. Sometimes I couldn't because they were up high, but he would get photos of them. And then um, we would come back and sit down at the computer and he would bring them up on the computer and then I could see what the bird had looked like, you know. Um, so through Wisconsin Council, I've actually taken um, two of the birding by ear classes now, the, the joint program between Madison Audubon and Wisconsin Council. And um, that's been so fun because I thought I just wasn't going to be able to do birding anymore. But because of that, I'm able to do it. I do it a different way. Um, sometimes with the monocular, once I hear the bird, I can see the bird. A lot of times I can't. Um, I did one of the birding by ear um, morning hikes back in, I think it was May, with uh, Madison Audubon. And um, I never saw any of the birds, but we heard a lot. I think we heard t more than 20, which was just fabulous. Um, so wow. it's, you know, it's kind of prolonged it. And that's let us uh, come in my backyard where I've got these 50, 60 feet trees and be able to, um, hear the birds when they're migrating in the spring and you know now in the fall um I'm, i don't i don't generally see them you know unless they come up on my deck but um you know i'm getting to hear them so i know i know what's in the neighborhood which is a lot of fun artist john giallombardo title lake and canoe scene audio description acrylic painting on a round canvas showing a small lake with an empty red canoe on its edge, framed by a green tree on either side. Artist John Giallombardo, title, beach scene, audio description, oil painting on canvas of a beach with purple sand, a boat teetering on the water's edge, a lighthouse in the distance, and a sky full of wispy white and yellow clouds. I think it started when I was a kid. I didn't paint, but I did a lot of coloring books. And when I was in public school, uh, I couldn't see the blackboard. So a lot of the time, instead of when I was supposed to be writing, I drew pictures all day. Then when I started painting, oh, a friend of mine who was a roommate in the job corps became a minister and asked me to do a painting of a lighthouse for him. And it just kind of grew out of that where I was getting requests from people I didn't even know. Fortunately, I have enough vision in one eye to be able to do it. Uh, and that's getting worse. So, cause I use a guide dog to travel with. But what I do is I have an easel, which is an old ladder and two lamps on the easel where I focus in on the canvas. And uh, everything I do is freehand. Uh, I don't draw anything, I do it all free. The one is a three foot by four foot uh, painting of a sandy beach. And in the center, there's a boat that was washed on shore, probably ancient sitting there. And in the far background on the right is a lighthouse on an island. And uh, it, it's kind of interesting because if you're not looking for it and all of a sudden it's there. I 
think when you looked at it, you mentioned the lighthouse, and not many people would mention it right away. In fact, I did it for uh, a friend of mine who was visually impaired, and he agreed to donate it back so we could put it in the gallery uh, for sale to raise money for the Wisconsin Council. The other painting was a round painting, and I had never done one of those before. I, I tried a canvas that was round, and I did it for a friend of mine who went to a nursing home. When I told her about it, she says, take it back, do a different painting for me, and donate it to the Wisconsin Council. So whatever amount of money people want to pay for these paintings, all the money will go to the council. I'll put a canvas on the easel and I might stare at it on and off for a day or two. But usually what happens is if someone wants a particular painting, they'll call me, we'll discuss it, and then I'll attempt to reproduce what they want. Now I've gotten calls from people who had former guide dogs or present guide dogs, and they sent me pictures and wanted me to reproduce it into a canvas. Or someone will want a lighthouse painting or a waterfall. Uh, just a variety of things. It's, it's been exciting. I've done over 150 paintings in, in the last two years. And some have become note cards that are selling all over the country. Uh, most of them are just paintings that I ended up shipping to people. Say that I was going to do a painting for you and after we got to know each other a little bit after each other on the phone and you had a particular scene I would focus in on what I know of you and what kind of scene but most of the time when I'm painting I'm not doing it it's almost a spiritual journey for me and it just happens on the screen you know um, I'm in on the canvas and uh, it, it, it's really phenomenal it really is it's, it's going on like on a journey each time with somebody wow John and Ellen thank you so much for your beautiful work and your awesome stories uh, just so all of our viewers know Many of the pieces of art that you see tonight will be available for sale, and I'll direct you to the Council website as we near the end of the program. John and Ellen have both very graciously uh, donated 100% of uh, the, the cost or the, the um, profit from their work as a donation to us. So thank you so much for your generosity. It's really amazing. So currently, there are about 100,000 Wisconsinites who live with vision loss. And we guesstimate that that's an underrepresentation because we're dependent on people self-reporting their vision loss in different surveys, like through the census and other data collection opportunities. And because there is still so much stigma about blindness, visual impairment, and vision loss, we uh, understand that many people may not self-report. So a more accurate number may actually be closer to 200,000 folks. Many folks with vision impairment are people who are experiencing vision loss later in life. So there are certainly folks like me who have been visually impaired since uh, my birth or throughout childhood or young adulthood, but the vast majority of people are working age adults who may become visually impaired through a retinal eye disease or another genetic visual impairment. They also may be older adults, and that's our fastest growing population with vision impairment from age-related macular degeneration, retinopathy due to diabetes, and um, glaucoma. That population, we estimate, will double before um, the, you know, the year 2030, and that's coming up quite quickly. 
So when our, uh, our likelihood of interacting and meeting with meeting someone who is visually impaired is quite high. Many of us may have family members, people that we love. If we are in the service industry, if we are a caregiver, we easily could interact with someone with a vision impairment. And there are some really important things to keep in mind when meeting someone who is visually impaired etiquette, ways to be really uh, helpful, ways to be really supportive. So we're going to take just a couple of minutes to share with you a video that we created here at the Council a couple of years ago. It's an animated video on uh, what to do when you meet someone with a vision impairment. It's also um, audio described so that um, anyone can be very aware of what's happening during the videos playing. We'll go straight from that video to meeting two more of our fantastic artists. Enjoy. When you encounter someone with vision loss, an aerial view of a group of seven people standing in a circle. There is one person outside of the circle. Keep people involved. The group of people moves towards the person. Invite people into the conversation. And they are added to the circle. Word bubbles pop up. Describe what is happening. When you encounter someone with vision loss, an animation of a person walking down a city street with a service dog. Do not pet or distract the service animal. A word bubble says, the dog is working. When you encounter someone with vision loss, use person first language. Blind woman. The words get switched, so it says woman who is blind. When you encounter someone with vision loss, use clear and concise information. Two animated hands slide up from the bottom of the screen. Use left or right arrows point to each hand instead of here or there. Arrows point to drawn half circles. Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired logo on a white background. Artist, Beulah Ford. Title, Snow-Capped Mountains. Audio description, acrylic painting on art paper of snow-capped blue and purple mountains with a blue sky above. Artist, Beulah Ford. Title, Spring Snow Storm. Audio description, a vertical acrylic painting on art paper suggesting fallen snow collecting on tree branches. Well, when I was a little girl, I used to look at my great grandfather's paintings and wish that I could do that and make something look real. So as I got older, <laughs> this is gonna, you're gonna laugh at this. Um, I used to lay, lay in um, on the porch Oh, and the um, roof had knots in it. I would imagine that I was looking at something. The knots would, would um, give me an idea of something. And then <clears throat> later in life, um, to make things real, I, I just studied things. I always loved nature. Um, I was born in a country home and I just had freedom to, to um, be in nature. I had cousins that I played with and we just would run in the pasture and, and just do things together. I just used um, a um, pencil that um, shows up. I, I, my vision stops me from reading with just plain a uh, pencil. It has to be a little darker, dark enough so I can see it. And then um, I like acrylics. Acrylics. Um, I have some you know, watercolors that I like, but <clears throat> you don't get the same effect. Uh, I did um, 
I did sell a picture that I did in acrylics. I almost threw it away. <laughs> and a friend of mine said, oh, I'll buy that. Here, here's a hundred dollars. <laughs> she framed it herself. I was living in Vermont at the time. And uh, it was a picture of the river. The one was a spring storm. It would be um, the spring buds were peeping through, but there was a, a snowstorm with sticky snow. And it just, um, it was a nice day. Poplar trees, yellow leaves, and um, the mountains were covered with snow. I think it was a nice, warm, sunny day. Well, I'm glad I can see as much as I do. I'm glad I could, had a cataract surgery and it turned out better than I expected. I'm just legally blind in one eye. <clears throat> I'm just thankful for what I am. Artist Mark Weber. Title, Forever in Bloom. Audio description, Metal sculpture of red, blue, and orange flowers with many petals. Artist Mark Weber. Title, Rooted in Nature. Audio description, Planter made from styrofoam and drywall mud made to look like a natural rock formation. I really have been making art since high school. That was my favorite class. Salvador Dali is my inspiration. However, since now I see much like a Dali painting, my inspiration has been more of my dislike for winter, thus wanting to create 3D objects of trees, rocks, flowers, etc. to have indoors. I use no real assistive technology. I use more feel than before as my sight has become less and less. I first think of what I want to create and then I picture it over and over in my mind until I know exactly how I want to make it. Uh, the Forever in Bloom is about 52 inches wide by 46 inches high. It is the result of having three old satellite dishes laying around and not knowing what to do with them. They are cut to make the flower petals. The dish mounting legs are obviously the flower stems. And I use some curly steel rods and some leftover cut out pieces from the satellite to make the small leaves. Rooted in nature is a boulder that actually has fissures or cracks. These cracks allow the boulder to separate in three pieces to allow a potted plant to be placed inside. In this piece, I currently have a Norfolk pine inside. It looks as though a tree that has sprouted in a crack in the boulder, just like you find in nature. Wow, thank you, Beulah and Mark. Those were amazing um, pieces of art and just really inspired. So let's look a little bit at how do our artists create their work? They've been telling you about that as they've been sharing, and many of them um, have used vision uh, rehabilitation techniques and accommodations to be able to continue doing their creations. So, as I mentioned earlier when we first started, we find ways to accomplish the tasks of everyday living, whether it's at work or at home, in ways that are accessible. And sometimes those ways of making things accessible are tactile. So our hands are outstanding guides for um, navigating our world. So what you might see through your eyes, we see through our hands. So our artists tonight and many of our other previous artists that we've had the uh, honor to work with use their hands in creating their artwork. One of our artists uh, uses her hands to interact with the canvas and the paint. 
because through her hands, she can feel where the paint is on the canvas, much more so than trying to see it through the end of a brush. Other artists use their hands to feel how um, the boulder feels, Mark described that, and where the natural places are for um, the art to emerge. Um, not only do we use our hands to help us navigate the world, we use really good lighting. And so some of our artists have described already this evening how they use light. You know, um, John building an easel out of a ladder and hanging lights on it so that he could really see well. So as we age naturally, we need more light. So even normal aging eyes require more light. And for those of us with vision impairment who still have some functional vision left, we require often just nice, clear daylight. And so part of our work here at the council, um, both when folks come in and when we visit people in their homes, is to help set up lighting, not only overhead or area lighting, but even task lighting, like John described with his easel. So the, an area where we're cooking, where we're maybe writing, where we're doing a craft, where we're applying makeup or shaving, is really well lit to make sure that we can accurately see um, what we need to be able to see. Some of our other artists described magnification. And so we might use handheld magnifiers um, to enlarge things, and not the kind we get at Wal a drugstore, but because those just simply aren't very strong, but really uh, medical grade ones to be able to see print and maintain our ability to read. Uh, maintain our ability to look at pictures and uh, grandchildren and the people that we love. And some of our artists use those kinds of handheld magnifiers to be able to see the details of the work that they're creating. Ellen so elegantly um, described how after taking photos, she goes home and uploads her pictures to her computer so she can magnify her screen and see what she really has there um, and be able to see it in detail. So there are digital magnifiers that we can use to be able to, again, read. Um, I'm a knitter, so sometimes I'll need to look at the knitting that I'm working on. Most of it is tactile for me, but there'll be times I'll look at it with a magnifier to be able to see um, a correction that I want to make or see how a particular stitch pattern works. And again, learning how to use those things just doesn't happen automatically. It comes with practice and it comes from a skillful vision rehabilitation educator or low vision therapist really helping us to fine tune and hone those skills. Ellen described the audio auditory world of birding by ear. And so our ears are often um, very much a part of um, our world through using assistive technology or access technology like screen reading software on our computers or our phones um, and our tablets. And again, we can teach those skills so that everyone can have full access to their computers. I know one of our artists will talk with you about auditory labeling, and so I'm excited for Evelyn to tell you about that, and I don't want to steal too much of her thunder. We can uh, label, or anyone can label, jars and containers and medication bottles and then use a special device called a pen friend that can pick up the, um, the labeling um, with, and read it to us auditorily. So there are so many things, and these clever artists have figured out how to use the vision rehab skills to extend that into their creativity and their um, innovation and their ingenuity to be able to continue their art. For many of us with vision impairment, isolation and depression and anxiety are realities. And so having something that lights us up, that gives us joy, 
that we can express our creativity and share that creativity with friends and families, and in this case, a, a wider community through art gallery, um, through the art gallery can help reduce that sense of isolation, bring down that feeling of anxiety and lift up those feelings of um, depression, lift that. So we're so glad that these artists have come forward to share their work and we're as hopeful for them that this is a rejuvenating thing as it is a gift to all of us to be able to share it and, and see it together. So let's meet two more of our artists. We're about halfway through our artist tour. So here we go. Artist Eli Santine, title Phillips Fight Stance. Audio description, cartoon style digital pencil drawing of a creature with wild bulging eyes legs apart with his weight on his bent left leg and fingers bent at bizarre angles. Artist Eli Santine, title, The Alien Voyager. Audio description, 3D digital render showing green, purple, and blue orbs in the corners and a larger red, blue, and green conical figure with points at both top and bottom at the center. I ironically got into art through a show called The Simpsons because I always, I looked at it for the first time and I thought, wow, this show has great pantomime performances. You know, there were these artists like David Silverman and Wes Archer who worked on The Simpsons as animation directors who really brought great acting to the show. And ironically, I got into animation through The Simpsons because it's ironic because The Simpsons isn't really recognized as a very um, lively show in terms of animation. It was very much writer driven. And I, so I started to draw sort of like imitating The Simpsons style. And then eventually I got into a show called Ren and Stimpy, which was a very popular Nickelodeon show during the 90s. And I realized that, wow, this is, this is very good art. This is wonderful animation. And that sort of made me divert my style from the Simpsons style to the Ren and Stimpy, to more of a Ren and Stimpy style. And then I eventually started getting into classic cartoons from the 40s and 50s, you know, the Warner Brothers cartoons and the MGM cartoons. And they had, and that really changed my sense of design for the better because you know, Ren and St with Ren and Stimpy, the design is the design is very complex. It's very hard to draw in that style. So when I started watching classic cartoons, I was like, "Gee, this is going to make me. This is going to make it a lot easier to draw my characters because the designs are very are simpler and more appealing." My process is basically I have an idea for a drawing in my head. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I just make up the drawing as I go along. But usually I have an idea in my head and I start drawing construction and I start drawing base construction, you know, like a circle for the head. Then I do a couple circles for the eyes and whatnot. And basically it's a lot, it, it involves a lot of undoing. I erase my animation a lot. In some cases when I'm doing digital animation, I do a lot of undoing because I'm sort of figuring out what I want my pose to be. And I just, I draw, I draw relatively roughly. I try to keep the, I, like the line strokes are rough, but I try to keep the drawing more clean and coherent. And oftentimes I, I usually like to draw on the iPad because in Photoshop, I can zoom in really far and get into the tiny details. So that's part of the access applications that I use. And with the 3D render, I would describe it as sort of a flying saucer as object, a U sort of a UFO as object. Um, with that, I was experimenting with proportional modeling. It was the first time I tried proportional modeling in a 3D modeling software. And I just sort of made it up as I went along. So I've definitely entertained pursuing a career in animation. I'm, I'm actually looking more to do more 3D animation because 
that's really where the that's really where you can find work these days it's like i would say classic cartoons i really love the warner Bros. and mgm cartoons you know by chuck jones and yeah. tex avery and bob clampett you know the the big names in animation that really established the meat that really established the medium uh that's kind of the style i'm really trying to go for and i feel like through learning through learning from these classic cartoons i feel like i'll be able to make like some great stuff and i'm also inspired by cg animation of the 90s you know back I really think that animation is the world's greatest art form because it combines so many of them into one thing to all the other artists who are participating in this keep drawing study your study your influences and try to incorporate some of your those influences into your work Artist, Evelyn Becker. Title, Kaleidoscope of Love. Audio description, Multicolored Hexagonal Crocheted Afghan Using a Puff Stitch. It depends how much sight they've seen. It's, if they've seen a kaleidoscope, you kind of get the idea of the colors being sort of mixed up. Um, I call it like a swirl or reflections. I can't see the end product. I'm just trying to envision it myself. And uh, it's sort of, it's a swirl of colors, six colors in this one. And I edge it in some color that makes a frame. So, so this one I think is edged in navy. I'm not positive, but I think that's what I edged it in. And when I get done with the Afghan, don't ask you which colors they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell you. I know which colors I've used, but I can't tell you what colors, where they're at or what they're, you're looking at. Got tired of watching TV, couldn't find stuff I like to watch, got bored with some books. You know, you get, after a while, you just do so much. I live in a big building of 95 apartments of elderly, uh, independent living, and I have lots of friends here, but COVID sort of shut us down as far as going out and having fun. We used to have many things that we did here. And um, I was editor of the newsletter here and vice president of the council. So it kept me pretty busy, okay? And then when I didn't have anything to do and I can't sit still for very long, I, sorry, I fidget. So I thought, well, let me make something. So sometimes I idly would try and make a rug or two because I used to make rugs. Um, but I couldn't find the right yarn. So I used some other yarn and I didn't like how it turned out. And then I said, well, I think I can use this one thing I made for rug for the end of my bid, like an afghan. I thought, why don't I make an afghan using the same stitch? And, but do my own pattern because I don't like rows and rows, like a row of red, row of blue, row of white. I want colors all together when they go together. So I, I developed the idea of doing 198 stitches and switching colors, which makes it look sort of swirly. And the first one I made was for my grandson and I used the colors of the uh, color wheel and put them together into a Afghan for him. And crocheting is fairly easy, um, no matter what you do with it. If you have to rip it out, it's easy enough to put it back together. Unless you try to match colors, you can't see what you're doing. You have to go to your neighbor and say, is this white or is this green? You know, um, and I take the colors and they they go in Ziploc bags. And on the outside of the bags, I put one of those talking label things from the, they have those talking wand labelers things. I love those things. And I label the outside of it and keep track of my colors in the bags and the order I want them to go in. I put that on the tag too. Originally I tried braille labels, but they don't stick too well and I'm not real good at reading braille. I can read some braille. Then I'd read it backwards. I go like, what did I put down here? So the talking, what they call it? A talking label wand, okay? And it is amazing. It's an amazing piece of work. You put anything on that thing that you want. I have my prescriptions labeled with it. My canned goods are labeled with it. Um, 
anything I turn around, I put something in the closet. Oh, I'm going to remember what this is. I go in there a week later and go like, what is that? It's another tube of something. But so that, that works out real well for me. Thank you, Eli and Evelyn, for sharing your work. I'm Lori Werbeckis, the Fund Development Director for the Council. We are so pleased to welcome Park Bank as a sponsor tonight. Thank you for your financial support of the Council and for the artists that are making Gallery Night possible. Donors to the Council play a major role in supporting the educational programs, vision services, and advocacy efforts throughout the year. We invite you to join us in supporting these life-changing services for people with vision loss. You can do so using the link to the Council's donation site in the chat. Now back to meeting our last two artists. Artist Gerald Johnson, title Woods of Wisdom, audio description, wooden table with a cypress cross-section top and tree root base. These are the words of Gerald Johnson. I've been making art all of my life. When I was eight years old, I was told not to use the X-Acto knife, but I did anyway and have the scar on my thumb to prove it. But that was the start of my carving, stonework, clock and table making, and many other things. I've always been inspired by the idea of making something out of nothing, and I was apparently good at it because people liked what I did. So I just kept doing whatever came to mind or fit a desire or need. Wood continues to be my favorite medium. I transitioned to making tables instead of carving. With my loss of vision, I've begun using feel more than visual cues. Woods of Wisdom is a table made from a cross-cut piece of a cypress tree with a live edge. In true cypress form, there are deep crevices all the way around. The surface is sealed with epoxy, giving it a nice smooth, shiny sheen. It sits atop a tree root that serves as the table base, spreading out from under the table in all directions. Artist Allison Fortney, title Allium Close Up, audio description, close up photograph of a flower with a round head composed of many small purple star-shaped flowers. Artist, Allison Fortney. Title, Purple and White Iris. Audio description, Close-up photograph of a flower with wavy petals that are white with purple edges. So I first wanted to take photography when I was in high school. However, I was having a number of health issues not related to blindness. And so, unfortunately, uh, I didn't have the time to, you know, take the full-fledged photography class where you got to develop your own film and that kind of thing. So my first experience with photography was my senior year in high school when I was able to take a multimedia class. And we were learning about, you know, taking video, putting together slideshows and that sort of thing, different multimedia presentations. And so that's when I first, you know, found out that I was actually good with the camera. And so when I went to college, that's when I got to explore it more. And it wasn't a requirement. See, I double majored in college in graphic design and web design and web development. And so, yes, you could take a photography course if you wanted, but it was like a shortened kind of class. But no, I wanted to be hands-on, shoot with film, not develop your own film, but shoot with film and just get to know the camera better. And so I did, my photography drastically improved um, while I was in college. And then I ended up getting my first uh, digital single lens reflex camera uh, when I was in college. So, and I've been shooting ever since. I think my inspiration is finding what other people might not see. And I, that's thanks to my vision. I have retinitis pigmentosa, so I have a loss of field vision. And so I have to focus more closely on my subjects. And if I'm like taking a walk through a botanic garden, I sometimes tend to walk slower. And if I see something that's interesting, I might pause, I'll examine it. And then if it's worth taking a picture, I will go ahead and take the picture. 
you know, and then I even, you know, before I even take the picture, I try and frame my subject in my mind. Okay, how would it look if I zoomed in really close on it? How would I look if I zoomed out a little bit further and included part of the background? So for me, what I sometimes have to do, because like I said, I have RP. So I sometimes have trouble seeing everything in the viewfinder. So what I might do is I can press a lot of digital cameras have this. They'll have like a big screen on the back where if you press the button, instead of having to look through the viewfinder, you can actually view it on the larger screen. I end up doing that sometimes just to see my subject better and to frame it better. And then once I've taken the pictures, I'll put them on my computer. I don't, at this point, I don't use any um, accessibility software. You know, what I end up doing is just zooming in really close on the pictures because I can see as much as I can, you know, in review on my camera. Like, I want to make sure it's sharp enough. You can see the details and the contrast well. And then what I'll do is take it onto my computer and then fine tune it. Do I need to make any adjustments, you know, for noise or just something that's out of focus or just other basic, you know, kind of color corrections or other photo corrections? One is a close up of Allium. And so it's a flower where if you look at it, you know, it's a circular kind of shape. And what you don't notice is that in that circular shape are these teeny tiny little star shaped purple flowers. And they all form together to make that big circular flower. And this is what I was talking about, you know, with seeing the details, a lot of people might not notice that. And so what I wanted to do was get nice and up close with it and show the detail. You know, I mean, those are those are one of my favorite flowers to photograph. Uh, those and cone flowers are my two favorites. And then for the purple and white iris, I liked it because it stood out against the mulch that was behind it. Number one, I mean, that was just a stark white. It wasn't just like kind of a cream or an off white. It was like white, white. And then the way the purple kind of blended in with it and how it contrasted and everything, I you know, just thought was a nice composition. Even though you are visually impaired or legally blind to keep pursuing your art passion, no matter what other people might say. You know, if it's something you love, then you keep doing it. Wow, Allison and Gerald, that is awesome. Thank you. And thank you to all eight of our artists. You know, one of the bummers I think about being virtual is not being able to physically interact with the art and actually be in the same room with the artist. Um, I would love to touch Gerald's table to feel that um, polyurethane top and then to feel the bumpiness of the cypress on the sides um, and the in the base. It just feels sounds amazing. And the stitch of Evelyn's afghan and to be able to smell um, that kind of rustic smell of the um, beautiful boulder planter um, that was described to us too. So just absolutely incredible uh, art that we heard about tonight and really powerful and touching stories. So cool to hear the artists in their own words, in their own voices, talk about their process and what inspires them and how they tap into their creativity and do it in ways that work for them, make it accessible and alive. We can visit more with each of our artists in a number of different ways. Well, maybe it's not a number, but it's a couple. Uh, we'll make this YouTube playable again and again and again. You can play it on repeat. You can share it with your friends and your family, and please do that. We would love to have more folks be able to visit with these artists through this recording. You can also come to our website at wcblind.org. Go to the events. Uh, menu and go down to gallery night and you'll be able to link from there to our online art gallery. All the pieces um, are both audio described. You'll get to hear our awesome volunteer Peter's voice again in describing each of the pieces um, if that is helpful for you. And then you'll also be able to see which of the pieces are available for sale. 
Some of the artists are donating 20% of their profits to the Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually Impaired, and two of our artists are donating the uh, full sale price. And some of the pieces mean so much to the artists that created them that they're that they're staying with them. They just shared us, shared them with us for this evening. So please visit that art gallery as well. And, you know, think about holiday shopping while you're visiting there. We're also hopeful that you'll take a little bit of time to learn more about the council at our website at wcblind.org. And if you or someone that you know and that you love is, is experiencing vision loss, we're really hopeful that you reach out to us to learn about either our services here at the council or to uh, work with us to connect you to other services in different parts of the state that, you know, that if you're a little bit further away from us. We know that people experiencing vision loss often wait anywhere from two to five years before they reach out for support because they think my vision's not bad enough yet. And we really would love to work with you early on so that we can support um, the changes that you're experiencing as your vision changes and that there's less interruption in the quality of your life and being able to do the things that you absolutely love to do. So please feel free to reach out to us by phone, by email, on the form on our website. I want to do a very special thanks uh, again to our sponsor for this evening and to the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art for motivating us to participate in this um, amazing event each year. Um, I want to thank our board um, and our staff for all of their support for the work that we do. And I wanna call out um, our amazing behind the scenes crew um, tonight who helped set up all the artwork and make it displayable behind me, who are running the tech and pressing the right buttons, things I know very little about. So I'm glad they know a lot about it. I have the easy part. I get to talk with all of you. It's what I do, I think, pretty well. They have the part that is not easy for me by making it all come together and look good. So particular hats off to Nick, Mitch, and Bob for all of their technical expertise. And then a hats off to Lori, who joined me on this side of the camera this evening. And a big, big thank you to our artists for giving their time and their talent. Uh, for the evening, and a big, big warm thank you to all of you who chose to make this your Friday night event. Be well, be safe, and take good care, and thanks again for, for coming. Good night. <laughs>